So uh, one of the challenges with incompressible flows, as is kind of well known, is that we need to enforce the di divergence free velocity field condition. And there's a number of different techniques to do this. The one that's implemented in PyFR right now is the artificial compressibility method. And I'll go over a little bit more detail on how that actually works. Um, but really the focus of this talk is on these three different convergence acceleration techniques. So I'm gonna go over uh, locally adaptive pseudo time stepping, polynomial multigrid, and these new optimal explicit Runga Kata methods that, that we've created over the last few years. And then finally, I'll touch on what kind of performance you can get by combining all three of these together. So first of all, the artificial compressibility method, this is an alternative to pressure projection and steady state. So I would say the majority of industrial uh, or commercial CFD solvers use the um, Poisson equation to solve for the divergence free velocity field. And ACM is an alternative to this that turns out to work quite well in the explicit framework such as PIFR. So the way that the ACM works is it uses this pseudo time problem to enforce incompressibility. So if you're trying to solve a steady state problem, you introduce this so-called pseudo time, which is this sort of steady state problem that you solve to converge the uh, compressibility constraints. And this can be extended with dual time stepping to uh, allow the ACM to be used for unsteady flows. So this means for each unsteady physical time step, you're solving a problem in pseudo time to steady state. And what this does is it introduces a global hyperbolic problem, which lets us leverage the explicit solver technology that's already in PIFR. And so really the motivation of using the ACM is to leverage the explicit technology um, that can scale out to, as Peter mentioned earlier, uh, thousands of GPUs. So just from sort of a, a high level, if you look at the conservation law on the top here, you'll see that everything to the right of IC uh, is basically just the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. You've got your partial derivative with respect to time and then the divergence of your fluxes. And when we use the ACM, we introduce this additional uh, pseudo time derivative. This is the del U by del tau that you see on the left-hand side of the conservation law. And it turns out that the vast majority of the work that you're doing in the ACM is trying to converge this pseudo time problem at every physical time step. And this is what you see kind of highlighted in blue here is the pseudo time problem. And what we do is we advance this or iterate this essentially using an explicit Runga Kata method. So you're trying to run this thing forward in pseudo time until basically it stops changing. If you look at the algorithm below, what you'll see is that for every outer loop, which is the physical time step, we have to do this kind of while partial u partial tau is greater than epsilon, solve the equation that's highlighted in blue, which is basically solve that pseudo time problem. So ultimately the performance of uh, the incompressible solver in PIFR using the ACM relies on rapid convergence of this pseudo time problem. That's where you're spending, you know, 99% of your work is in converging the pseudo time problem. And as I mentioned, we're gonna look at three different uh, convergence acceleration techniques, starting with polynomial multigrid. So if we look at polynomial multigrid, it's similar kind of in spirit to geometric multigrid. So in PIFR, since we're using flux reconstruction, we're representing the solution with a high polynomial degree, right? So let's say we're using a quartic or quintic polynomial to represent our solution. So similar to geometric multigrid where you would use coarser grid levels, right? You would take, let's say your second order finite volume code and find coarser grid levels to do geometric multigrid. What we're gonna do with poly polynomial multigrid is instead just leverage lower polynomial degrees. So if we've got a quintic representation of the solution on each cell, then we can use, let's say the uh, quartic, cubic, quadratic and linear uh, lower polynomial degrees to act sort of like a, a multigrid level. And the advantage of doing this is that on these coarse grid levels, there's really kind of three major things. One is that they have less strict CFL limits, which means we can take bigger pseudo time steps on these coarser grids. They also have fewer degrees of freedom, so they're less expensive per iteration. And similar to geometric multigrid, we expect that the low frequency error is converged faster on those coarse grid levels. And then what we do is we kind of take the solution, go down to the coarsest grid level, and then eventually prolong the prolongate the correction back up to the finest grid level to accelerate convergence. So here's what a polynomial multigrid cycle looks like. This is a three level uh, V cycle. And on the top, 
here you see U3, which is let's say our, our solution represent, represented on uh, cubic polynomials. So the way that this works is we do some iterations on this uh, finest polynomial degree. We then restrict this down to let's say quadratic, restrict it again down to uh, linear representation, doing iterations as we go down. And then we prolongate that correction back up, again, doing iterations as we go back up towards the uh, finest polynomial degree. And really what we're trying to do is do as much work as possible on these lower polynomial degrees where it's extremely cheap relative to the, the higher polynomial degree. So to give you just an example of some kind of performance uh, benefits that you can get from this, the first of these is an unsteady circular cylinder case. And I'm going to show this for each of the uh, convergence acceleration technologies. So if we look at something like an unsteady uh, circular cylinder, by using polynomial multigrid, we get speed up factors somewhere around six. And similarly, if we look at something in 3D, such as the incompressible Taylor Green vortex, we get speed up factors somewhere between uh, three and four for this particular case, right? So we can see we can get fairly significant uh, speed up factors by using polynomial multigrid. The second convergence acceleration technology is locally adaptive pseudo time stepping. So if you think about an explicit uh, solver, your time step is limited by your local CFL criterion, right? So if your cell is extremely small, that means you have to take a small time step. And what locally adaptive pseudo time stepping allows us to do is use a different pseudo time step size for each element and indeed for each uh, conservation equation. So this can be determined by, for example, the element size, the polynomial degree, uh, the local wave speeds in a given cell and the properties of the runga kutta scheme that you're using. And the way that this limit is estimated is using an embedded pair runga kutta scheme. So basically on each um, element in the domain, the embedded pair runga kutta scheme gives an estimate of kind of the, the, the error in pseudo time. And that lets you control the pseudo time step size for, for each element. Uh, and then another important point here. So we're gonna, we're gonna adjust this kind of dynamically for each element, for each field variable. And then this can also be scaled up on coarser grid levels when we're using key multigrid. So the pseudo time step size can be made larger as we go to coarser levels. So here's an example of the same circular cylinder test case. And what you see on the top left is the same vorticity plot. And then the other three plots show the pseudo time step size for each um, field variable. So for example, in the bottom left, we've got the x velocity. In the bottom right, we've got the y velocity in the top right we've got the uh, pressure. And the important thing that you'll notice is that you can see that uh, the pseudo time step size varies quite a bit across the domain. So for example, in very large elements, like in the, in the wake of the cylinder, you can see we've got large pseudo time step sizes. And then near to the surface where the CFL limit's more strict, you can see we've got uh, significantly smaller uh, pseudo time step, step sizes. So for this cylinder case, uh, implementing the adaptive pseudo time stepping gives you a speed up factor of, of somewhere around four. And another case that Nikki ran in 3D is this SD7003 airfoil. Uh, again, getting speed up factor somewhere between two and three. Now, the last uh, convergence acceleration technology I'm going to talk about is these optimal explicit Runga Kutta schemes. So, as I mentioned earlier, the maximum pseudo time step size you can take is governed by the properties of the runga kutta scheme that you use, right? So each explicit scheme will have a different maximum CFL number depending on the polynomial degree and all, all these kind of different things. Now, the important point is that each runga kutta method has associated with it a stability polynomial, which defines the linear stability properties of the scheme. And each stability polynomial has a region of absolute stability. And it's this region that governs how big our pseudo time step size can be. One important point is that since we're trying to converge the uh, pseudo time problem to steady state, we don't really care about time accuracy. So this means that first order accurate in pseudo time is, is sufficient because it's not, uh, it's not directly linked to our ac accuracy in, in physical time. So if we look at a stability polynomial, so here's a kind of typical stability polynomial on the top for a first order runga kutta method. And you'll see that it's got a monomial form, basically one plus z plus some coefficient times z squared and on and on and on. So if we want to keep at most first order accuracy, then we have to keep the one plus z terms in our stability polynomials. But what that means is for each stage that we add, we are adding another 
term that can be optimized. So now these coefficients or these gamma j's can be optimized not to get higher order accuracy, which people usually do with Runge-Okada methods, but to get better stability to allow us to take a larger time step size. So this gives an optimization problem, which you see on the line below, which is to optimize these unknown gammas to yield the maximum pseudo time step size. And some examples of these op optimal stability polynomials are shown on the bottom here. So in the top left figure, you see an optimal uh, two stage scheme. And then in the bottom right, you see an optimal seven stage scheme. And what you'll notice is that as we add more stages, these regions of stability get much, much larger, right? So you should notice that the axes are changing on these plots. So the, uh, the plot on the bottom right is maybe, you know, 10 or 15 times larger stability region than the two stage scheme. The other thing that's nice that we showed uh, recently is that these can be now combined into embedded pairs. So basically we can use two first order schemes. Let's say we have a 10 stage scheme and a nine stage scheme that are our optimal Runge-Kutta methods. And what we use is divergence of the nine stage scheme. So when we see that that one's starting to blow up essentially, that's how we limit the pseudo time step size. So this allows kind of automatic determination of how big the pseudo time step size can be. So if we go back to that circular cylinder test case again, just by using these uh, optimal Runge-Kutta methods, which in practice takes modification of maybe about seven or eight numbers in your code and that's it, you get a speed up factor of around two. And then a similar case is this incompressible turbulent jet, where again, we saw speed up factors of around two by switching to the optimal Runge-Kutta scheme. So the important point here, and this is a slide that I adapted from Nikki, is that uh, these acceleration technologies can all be used together. So if we start as RK, with RK4 as our kind of baseline pseudo time stepping method, and then we add instead these optimal Runge-Kutta methods, we see a speed up factor of around two. And then if we use locally adaptive pseudo time stepping, we get another speed up factor of around three or four. And then adding polynomial multigrid gets a speed up factor of around six or seven. And by the end, if we combine all these technologies together, and this is what Nikki found in, in, uh, in his re more recent papers, you can get speed up factors in excess of 20 by combining all these technologies with each other. And parallel to this, we've also seen advancements in, in hardware, right? So when Nikki started his PhD back in around 2015, uh, or I guess he started around 20, 2017, um, but we were using kind of the K20s at that time, which had somewhere around one teraflop. And soon this year, we should be able to get the Ampere uh, NVIDIA GPUs getting closer to uh, 20 teraflops. So this is around a 16x speed up in terms of hardware. So combining these two, if we look at combining the uh, algorithmic advancements over the last year, as well as the hardware advancements, sorry, over the last five years, as well as the hardware advancements over the last five years, we, we, we get speed up factors somewhere in, in the neighborhood of three to 400 which is what we'll uh, have to test once we get the Ampere GPUs. So the last thing that I wanna show is just a demonstration test case that I think Peter touched on in, earlier in his talk. And this is the DARPA sub-off test case, which is a complete submarine configuration and a Reynolds number of 1.2 million. So really getting up into the kind of the industrial Reynolds numbers here. And this was meshed using an unstructured mesh and here's a, a plot of the surface mesh show, showing that it uses uh, curved elements on the surface. And again, a high order representation of the solution inside of each of these cells. So here's the uh, wake or kind of aft region of the sub. So what you see coming from the bottom left is basically the boundary layer from the upstream portion of the submarine. And then this is interacting with the, the tail structures on the sub and then propagating downstream into the wake. And we can plot a slice through this to show vorticity contours. So this is showing the fidelity of the simulation where you've got a range of different physical scales of different sizes of, of turbulent structures. And then also obviously important in the context of submarine is the pressure field, which lets you extract acoustic uh, properties, which are obviously important for um, sonar, sonar kind of uh, observability of the submarine. Here's some quantitative results from that test case. So this is in the wake of the sub. If you see that dashed line um, at the kind of right-hand side of the figure on the top, that's a wake profile through uh, 
through that slice. And the bottom two plots show a comparison between the results with pi FR, uh, shown in the blue line, and then the experimental data, importantly, in the, in the white circle. So you can see really good agreement between the two uh, data sets. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is that activating all of these is quite simple. It's all just done through the configuration file. So for example, if you want to use P multigrid with the incompressible solver, all you have to do is specify a sequence of orders and how many steps you want to take at each order. So this is that kind of V cycle that I showed earlier, where you pick the polynomial degree you want at each level and how many, uh, how many pseudo time steps you want to take at each level. If you want to activate the locally adaptive pseudo time stepping, all you have to do is turn on the uh, local Pi controller and use one of the adaptive Runga Kutta schemes. And if you want to use the optimal Runga Kutta schemes, you just have to choose uh, the Vermeer setting for the time stepping option. And then there should be some of these um, embedded pair adaptive schemes coming in, in soon. So uh, just the last thing is a few references. So these are the main references for each of the convergence acceleration technologies I've touched on. The first is uh, Nikki's original paper on the incompressible solver with P multigrid, then the locally adaptive pseudo time stepping, and then two uh, recent papers on these optimal Runga Kutta schemes and adapting them as embedded pairs. And with that, I'll take any questions.